I assume you didn't have a black dress. You? In a manner of speaking. Can you not afford a maid or a housekeeper? You're a ghost. You're an apparition. I'm seeing an apparition. It's entirely understandable. You just buried your only son. Yes, grief, yes, grief, that, that would explain it, that, that would explain it. I'll make myself some tea, I'll sit down, I'll take a deep breath and it will pass, it will pass. You will go away. Uh, none for me, thank you. I wasn't thinking of making you any. And Tom was not our only son. He came back here, I understand. Back home. Yes, but why do you say it that way? You must know, you must know that... Oh, for God's sake, I'm, I'm talking to a figment of my own imagination. You sure about that? Oh, you have been long gone. Long gone from this earth and long gone from my life. And what happened to Tom? What happened to our son? I'm not discussing it with you. I am not discussing Tom with, a, with an apparition. I'm not doing that. Are you quite sure I'm an apparition? Well, of course I'm sure. Something I ate, my pills, uh, exhaustion. Good night's rest and you will be gone. Puff, up the chimney, puff of smoke. You were always a very rational woman. No flights of fancy for our Margaret. And why was it always so hard for you to believe that a woman could be rational? Your kettle's boiling. What? Oh, so it is. Was he any good? Was who any good? The Tom, of course. I mean, as a musician. It is what he did, isn't it? He dropped out of college, went off to play in a band. He was in the Navy. Played in the Navy band during the war. Afterward, dance bands. The Royal York Hotel. Bath Springs in the summer. Did he? Well, you know very well he did. You know everything I know. But why do you insist on asking me these questions? What do you want this conversation for? Perhaps you want this conversation. Oh, I have not missed your wit and your conundrums. I have not missed them. Yet you never left. You never moved. You stayed in the house we shared. But it wasn't easy for a woman to move. You mean emotionally, of course. No, no, no. The rest of it, mortgages, ownership. You left us in the 30s. Well, I could inherit a mortgage, but banks certainly wouldn't allow a woman to sign for a new one. And you left me with four... with three, with three children. They were grown by then. The girl's about to be married. Tom, a young man. And I did not leave you. I died, as you might recall. Oh, through your own stubbornness, your own pig-headed stubbornness. It was a disease. Oh, it was no better than that. And the girls, how did they make out? They both married well, if that's what you mean. Two young women you raised settled for marriage. <laughs> how extraordinary. Well, I thought you'd be pleased. Oh, I was never opposed to a... Suitable career for my girls? Suitable. Yes, of course, suitable. Yes, of course, suitable. And Thomas? Mm. Well, well, you know, I think at first his music saved him. When the war came, well, he enlisted, of course, but he spent the war playing in the naval band, entertaining. Otherwise, who? Then it killed him. What do you mean? Well, you know, the music, the music killed him. You know all that. Go on. Well, after the war, right after the war, he got a job. Well, a gig, I believe they call it, with Moxie Whitney. Spent the summer playing at the Bath Springs Hotel in the house band. Well, he sang sometimes, but mostly played the saxophone. All those swing songs. 
jazz, I suppose. Hmm. And I booked myself in for the entire summer on a whim. You watched over him all summer? Well, the girls were married off. I was alone. Why shouldn't I spend the summer at a resort taking the healing salts and the mountain air? I put myself a table by the bandstand every night. <clears throat> the war was over. Everyone was celebrating, trying to forget. you could test your theory by giving me a cup of tea. And perhaps you could get it yourself. <laughs> I say little has changed. Sleep, psychoanalysis. 
I want to know about Tom. Tom. Wait, Tom. All right. Tom. Oh, Tom. Oh, one word. Alcohol. His career slipped away. His marriage. He drifted back here to this house. Moved back into the very room it has his child. The very room, the very room he had had as a child. Oh, he got a job first. Auto parts, I think, and he played sometimes after hours clubs. I never heard him. He never played in his room. He came and he went. And he died. He developed cancer of the bone marrow. He, he died from cancer. Yes, well, no, no, the, the cancer didn't kill him. Yes, well, that's what the doctors said. Oh, doctors. He had a seizure. He died in the hospital. Oh, the doctor said it had metastasized to the brain, and that is what caused the seizure. But no, 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 it was alcohol. It was not the cancer that killed him, it was the alcohol. DTs. He was admitted to the hospital. Four days later, he's trembling. He has a seizure, he dies. Alcohol withdrawal, it was alcohol withdrawal. Does it make any difference? Yes. No, maybe. Does it make any difference? No. Yes, yes. Alcohol. Now where did that come from? Your son, God forgive me, was a drunk. You forget everything else about him. I was a good mother. Everyone said I was a good mother. Hmm. He needed a father. He needed the stability of a father. Someone to talk him out of that life. Perhaps if you hadn't left us. I didn't leave. I died. An incurable disease. That's not incurable. I couldn't stomach the treatment. Oh, a few mouthfuls of raw liver every day. Oh, how difficult could that be? They have pills for it now. Injections. Oh, oh that last afternoon at the beach. The McMorrans, you remember it? All those stairs down to the beach. It was, it was a holiday weekend. We were a family again. We were a family again. And you walked out on us. I didn't walk. I was too weak to walk. Certainly too weak to climb those stairs. Oh, yes, you had one of the boys carry you. I think it was, it was a fiancé of one of the girls. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I shall never forget that. You asked him to carry you away, carry you up that flight of stairs. You, you couldn't handle it. Oh, you were weak. In more ways than one. Oh, God, Margaret. I'm sure I remember it better than you do. <laughs> it was a fine day. I can almost smell it. The tall firs, the tide out, the warm sun. The children being children again, splashing around in that Cold, cold water, Mount Baker off in the distance. <laughs> and you, sitting there in a purple dress as always, an elegant sun hat, going on and on and on and on, as if, as if. Oh, we're going, Sid. Oh, as if, oh, oh, you're not ready to hear it. I must be. Whatever it is, I must be. I, I conjured you. I just buried my son. Neither of the girls is called to ask after me. Neither one of you. Perhaps they're as tired as I am. I'm tired of what? Your prattle. Your self-serving prattle. Oh, what is that supposed to mean? You don't see it? <laughs> the stories you tell, endlessly tell. 
what you said to this person and, and what you said to that person and how to boil an egg, and how many times to chew, and how many times to brush your hair, and, and how events have proven you so right in so many ways, and how generous you have been, and how many sacrifices you have made. It's all of it because you couldn't accept... Horace! Horace! That was the name of the boy who carried you up those stairs. Now I remember it. Horace. Now, what sort of a name is that, I ask you? Horace. Now, why would his mother saddle him with a name like that? Well, she can't have read Greek poetry, nor had some kind of a affiliation for journalistic history. Did he have a nickname? Do you remember? I don't recall the nickname. Oh, precisely. Because the short form of Horace is Hor. Well, <laughs> I mean, can you imagine it, really? Hor, dear, would you mind just passing me that, that magazine? And what's he got to say on the telephone? Hi, Tom. Hor, dear. <laughs> uh, Minnie, you can't be something of a snob. I'm not a snob. I mean, considering the fact that your own mother was an Irish serving wench. Oh, 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 oh and now who is being a snob? Mm. I retract the word wench and uh, replace it with uh, poor, uneducated Irish. Yes, but as you may recall, my maiden name is Keats. Ah, yes. From the family of the English poet, as you have so often reminded us, uh, despite the absence of any solid evidence on which to base that assumption, apart from your literary pretensions. There was no formal education in those days. It was out of the question. You know that, especially for women. I read the classics, modern literature, and I am not pretentious. No, no, no certainly not. Hello? Oh, yes, yes, I'm fine. Yes, I made it back in one piece. Yes, mm-hmm, yes. Yeah. Well, no, well, I was just getting ready to go to bed now. Yes, I was, no, 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 nothing's wrong, no. Apart from the obvious. Yeah, no, well, no, I'll let you go now. Good night. I, no, no, I'm sure. No, I'll let you go. Good night. She must be in shock. Over a brother's death? No, you not wanting to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't very well say I had company, could I? <laughs> that her father had come back from the grave to visit. Oh, she'd have sent Hall to check up on us. She wouldn't drive herself? No, she doesn't drive. Amazing. A daughter of yours who doesn't drive. <laughs> oh, I remember the first time you drove the Lizzie. Oh, you fought tooth and nail for the privilege. <laughs> I remember you sitting up there high in the front seat in your fox furs and your fancy hat, tooting all over town. Now, you weren't going anywhere. I just wanted to prove a point. I was a businesswoman. Yes, yes. Your name was right there in the city directory, 1905. Minnie Keats, dressmaker. <laughs> Amid a sea of male names, uh, a few other women listed were listed as widow, I believe. Oh, there were a handful of others listed in professions that you would consider suitable for women, domestics nurses, teachers, and I was not simply a dressmaker. I managed a department, and it should have read manager, as yours did, exactly the way your name is listed. They don't listen to you, you know. Oh, what are you on about now? Your daughters. When you call them on the telephone, and you talk to them on the phone for hours and hours on and on, they don't listen. They don't listen to you. Of course, I know that. I suspect Fran is probably reading or ironing or doing the crossword. She just picks up the receiver now and then says, mm, mm, mm. Might as well be a psychiatrist. <laughs> Are you going to bed now? Well, I won't be able to sleep. Even if I promise to leave. Why did you? Why did you leave us? Why did you refuse to open your mouth and eat? I mean, it was only a, a handful of chopped liver, for God's sake. And you just lay there, getting weaker and weaker. Weaker and weaker. 
I prepared it exactly as the doctor told me. You just turned your head away. It would not have helped. Didn't even try. I was very tired. Tired of life. Yes. Tired of me. You can be. <laughs> you are exhausting. Your causes. Your insistence on doing the exact opposite. The exact opposite. Of what of is expected of a lady? Exactly. You once liked that about me. <clears throat> you swept me away. I was a simpleton caught up in your ambitions, your manias. You were the Gibson girl who turned men into tongue-tied twits. I was, wasn't I? I think you only married me because uh, time was running out if you were to have children. I oh, was only 29. 30. 29! Almost 30. Oh, your precision continues to astound me. Some years were good. Were not some of our years together good? Mm -hmm. Memories of fickle mistress. Tell me this. How clearly do you remember a meal, or, or the smell of the ocean, or those afternoons in the garden watching the children play in the leaves turn? Oh, you remember the raw liver that you wouldn't eat, the beginning of war, the illness? No, 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 you don't remember the salad and the bread. You remember that piece of chicken that gave you salmonella. It is not true. I remember some joyful moments, some pleasant moments. I'm trying to. I am trying to remember this young man that was our son, learning the keys of the saxophone, playing the piano, bringing a girl home, and how excited he was to play in that band. I'm trying to remember those moments of joy it all gets crowded out with our arguments. Oh, that troubled man dragging his wasted body back home not 20 years later. And that last swollen, drunken bitch that he brought oh, back into it. this house. Stop it, stop it. It does you no good. You cannot sleep with anger. It's too late. Too late, it's all much too late. Perhaps a glass of whiskey can help. <coughs> you had many suitors before me and not a few after. Yes, I did, didn't I? Mm. All those tea dances at the Empress, huh? A quaint idea. There were a few before you, and some of those boys could dance, too, better than you. Some of them were good marriage prospects. Do you know that one had a provincial park named after him? If you had only known. Oh, I'm not impressed by such matters. They do not affect me. I am not impressed by titles. Uh, you are a complicated woman, Margaret. So modern and so traditional. Yes, I think it was. One of those tea dances, the, the trolley was running along Douglas and up Fort Street, and I don't think there were any motor cars then. I dressed to go out to tea on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, I was, I was living at some, some boarding house on Broad Street with some other young and not so young unencumbered girls, all going to work on the trolley every morning to David Spencer's department store. Oh, well, Eaton's now with clothes off the rack, but then I was in charge of the dressmaking department. And I was not yet 25, I'll have you know. But that afternoon, I put on a purple dress that I had made myself. Oh, I thought it was exquisite. But then the landlady approached me and told me I could not wear purple. That purple was a color reserved for ladies of the night. 
I think she was more concerned about appearances than she was about any sexual mores. I know your answer to that. Oh, of course. From that day forward, I have worn nothing but purple. <laughs> Solidarity with your fellow downtrodden citizens. Well, I look good in purple. Yes, you did. Did? I misspoke my tense. Do. You do look good in purple. Well, I have always thought so. Why? Why could you never suffer the bondage of domestic life? Because it was bondage. I've advised our grandsons not to marry. Not your granddaughters? No, oh, but they still believe in Cinderella. Times are changing. Hmm, perhaps. But never fast enough for you, Margaret. Men still run the world, Francis. You think women can do a better job? It's hard to see how women could do any worse. <laughs> Who would raise the children? Oh, well, perhaps we should leave them alone. Let them grow up on their own. Oh, no, no, no. Children need uh, discipline, rules, uh, attention. They need somebody there when they, when they fall ill. Uh, do not go there, Francis. Do not take my thoughts there. Not, not on this day of all days. Do you not think it sits there like a chain, like a weight, like a, like a hidden door always beckoning? Do you not know how much I have had to do? Do you not understand the effort required to be always nurturing and loving and generous and kind while being, while being deathly afraid? Of what? Men? Yes, men. Yes. And other things. You were always so strong, so independent. Uh, oh. You had so much, uh, so much, oh, what is the word? Uh, insouciance. <laughs> you terrified men, uh, especially your sons-in-law to be. I terrified men? Nonsense, Amelia, spoke my mind. I was 19, you know. Oh, well, no, no, you would have no idea. You grew up here. You spent your whole life here. But I was only 19 when I left home and traveled across a continent. A woman alone. A girl alone. That takes courage. Were you running from something? <clears throat> no. Well, yes, from something to something. First by carriage and rail to San Francisco, and then up the coast to a steamship, and then by carriage and rail again to this odd but genteel little backwater of a town. <laughs> I read Hints to the Lady Traveller by Miss Elsie Davidson. She advised to reduce one's petticoats, but show no ankle, keep the, the blouse buttoned, loosen your corsets, uh, keep the hair up, but wear a bonnet suitable to the climate, and take one's own washing equipment. A portable toilet would be more to the point. You didn't wear a corset, did you? I never wore corsets. Well, you know that. Ridiculous contraptions. But can you imagine sitting in a Pullman coach for seven days strapped into a corset? <laughs> Too bad that Miss Davidson had nothing to say on the topic of menstruation. Do you know we had nothing then? We had to devise our own pads and equipment and wear them under layers of petticoats and pretend that nothing was happening. Out of the window late at night. <laughs> I believe that many a crow has feasted on my blood in the of Kansas. <laughs> Must we talk about that? Oh, you're such a prude, Francis. You were always such a prude. And you, my dear, just love to be shocking. No, but I was never afraid to speak my mind. You just said you were deathly afraid. Oh, well, afraid, not afraid, afraid, not afraid. That's how we lived our lives. Bravado and fear. Girls are burning their brassiers now, Francis. Did you know that? <laughs> oh, how a 
would love to be with them, young again. I would travel back to San Francisco and I'd wear flowers in my hair. And I'd demand equal rights and I would join those sittings. Oh, isn't it enough to have won the right to vote? Didn't you ever want to see how it all turned out, Francis? That we went through the, the, the crash and the depression, another war was coming and you left. Did you not want to see how it all turned out? It never turns out, Margaret. It never finishes. It just goes on and on. This stupid, thoughtless, dying planet. Francis, look at me. Do you see me? Yes, I, I see you. No. No. No, you don't. You never did. Of course I do. Well, shall I show you my ankles, Francis? Shall I show you my breasts? Would you like to smell me, Francis? Oh, now stop being so crude. Stop. What did you want of me, Francis? What did men want of me? Pride and sassy, but demure and obedient. Work, but don't get paid. Bleed and give birth, but do it privately. Weep and cry, but take the blame. Run the household, but do not control the money. Oh, you men. Oh, you create the wars and the economic collapses, and, and we women bleed and suffer in silence. You've done all right for yourself. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I managed to salvage a thing or two from that financial disaster that you left us with. I <clears throat> managed to find a broker who was willing to take instruction from a woman. I pieced it back together. Our finances, that is. I own this house. I own this house. If I may say so, Francis, I was a damn sight better at investing than you were. I would leave on that note if I were not a figment of your delirious brain. Yes. <coughs> you would walk out, wouldn't you? Yes. That is how you would deal with it. That is how you always dealt with everything. Put on your hat and storm out. Leaving me to deal with whatever crisis was at hand, you would simply walk away. You were not a man. You were never a man, a panty-waisted book with your little silver-headed cane and your little leaded beard, damn you. God damn you. Well, go, go. Feel free to leave. Feel free to leave. Perhaps neat. No, you have nothing to say. Damn it. had some good times, didn't we? Before the babies came, and that stupid, stupid war. And then they came, one after the other. And the war ended, and when the children were old enough, I went back to work. Oh, I know you didn't want that. You didn't want that. Our friend was 12 and Sheila was 10 and Tom, Tom must have been 9 and Donnie and we danced again and we listened to the music on the radio and I dragged you to those Unitarian meetings <laughs> and all the children took piano lessons and they were all healthy and all going to school and I got my figure back although I don't suppose you noticed did you notice Francis? I noticed 
gave us the vote. Oh, they never thought to prohibit us from driving. And the ladies started to show a little ankle. Now, do you remember that, Francis? <laughs> oh, do you remember how worried you were when the children started changing on the beach, concealed only by a large bath towel blowing in the wind? Mm. Oh, those Sunday afternoons at Cordova. Drives up the Malahat, birdcage walk, our picnics at the gorge, and rose gardens at the Empress. And Emily, do you remember Emily? Do you remember how she used to walk around town with that little monkey on her shoulder? Oh, oh well, she had no children to give her grief. She's famous now. Francis, did you know that? is her name is right there in that same city directory. 1905, Car Emily Artist. Keats, Minnie, dressmaker. Keats, Minnie, dressmaker. Oh, why do we have children, Francis? Why do we have children? We have children because... Oh, no, 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 don't answer that with one of your homilies, with some overripe sentimentality, and some old world notion that they will care for us in our old age. Remember which is worse, Francis? To see our children so unhappy or our... Sons die before us. Children allow us to experience love. Oh, and fear, and terror, and rage, and loss. Why would you want that? Why would you want that? No, you're not going to answer that. <laughs> Did I ruin him, Francis? Did I ruin you? Margaret, what answer do you want me to give to you? What answer do you want? Oh, God, not the truth. Heaven knows I don't want the truth. Well, then I will tell you lies. Oh, half-truths, Francis. Start with half-truths and approach the truth very tenderly. It's not always good, Margaret, to have a woman as strong as you for a mother. A child could get lost in the folds of your purple dress. I never smothered Tom. I did not do that. But he pursued his music. I did not stop him. I was referring to your daughters. They, they married and raised children. They married and raised children. They married and raised children. Exactly. Your daughters. You, the suffragette, the businesswoman, the adventurer, the despoiler of religion. Advocate of free love, birth control, even, I gather, of uh, feminine hygiene products. Merely that we be allowed to speak and be heard. I see no biological impediment to that. Perhaps that's what you men are so afraid of. Did it do you any good, Margaret? Where is this going, Francis? Where are you taking my thoughts? You're the adventurer, Margaret. You're the courageous one. Once, perhaps. There's a cost to bear, a price to pay. Not now, Francis, not now. What better time? No, not, not at this age. Not when it's too late. Not when I have just buried our second child. This is precisely the right time, the inevitable time. No. Yes. No. Donald. No. Donnie. Dinny. We called him Dinny. Oh, God, is this where this is going? Is this where you want to take my thoughts? I'll, I, I'll banish you. I, I'll stop you from going there. He was five. Oh, God, you bastard, stop it. A marvelous age for a little boy, so innocent and curious and playful. Oh, stop it, please, stop it. Admit it. He was on your mind as you were burying Tom. The little one, the perfect one. The child who would raise himself, little Dinny. Oh, it was many years ago. And with you every day of your life. Oh, yes, yes, all right, yes, but I, 
I have never questioned it. I have never Every questioned it. Every day of your life. No. Every day of your life you've tried to undo it. Oh, no. Children die. It happens. Especially then, especially in those days. It happened. In, in childbirth shortly after, in childhood. It's sad, but it happened. Why, William Hazlitt could not remember the number of children to whom his wife gave birth. Don't clutter this up with your erudition, your burdensome trivia. This is not about the fact of being born or the fact of dying. It's not about that. No. No, but there was no right or wrong. There was no right or wrong. There was no judgment to be made. It happened. We did not have antibiotics then. It happened. It happened to many people. And you were his mother. Yes, and a good one. A good mother. I was a good mother. Diphtheria. Oh, yes, diphtheria. Yes, he died of diphtheria. I know this, but why speak of this now? Web closes over the throat. Suffocation. A cruel death and slow suffocation. Stop it. Stop it. I do not need to see this. I do not need to know this. There was no treatment, no cure. What is the point in going over this again? What is the point? It happened in this room. You remember this very room, much as it is now. The war was over. The economy was buoyant in 1920. I had just been promoted and you were back to your activities. Oh, you saw my activities that way, didn't you? You saw them that way. Time fillers, women's avocations, needlepoint, watercolors for ladies. I was a manager again, like you. Well, I wasn't paid nearly as much. I was a manager. We thought he had a cold. Yes. He thought, didn't he, had a cold? Yes, yes, it was a head cold, yes, with a little on his chest. And a cough, a, a small rasping cough, and, but no fever. Well, maybe a little fever, but it, but it was just a cold. It was just a cold. Oh, the crew, but worse, we agreed on that. It was just a cold. And I had a big meeting to attend in Vancouver, an important meeting, a company meeting which meant a Canadian Pacific steamship ride from the Inner Harbor of Victoria to the Inner Harbor of Vancouver. Five hours each way. You'd be gone the whole weekend. Yes. And? Oh, do, you, do you really want to go over this again? Do you really want to? Is this what you are really demanding of me? You had something to attend. Or not sure what it was. Oh, well, you wouldn't remember, would you? Oh, that is so difficult. You had a company meeting, but I, oh, nothing important. Woman's activities. Well, it wasn't about the vote. You got that in 1917. Maybe it was a meeting of that uh, socialist party, the one started by Mr. Kingsley. It was work. And it was every bit as important as your affair. Oh, you say so. Oh, you are a bastard. Mine was an important meeting. I had to go. And you expected me to stay home and to forego my important meeting? Yes. Yes. Well, you could have stayed home. Why not you? I had to go. I had to attend. Oh, so your imperative should trump mine as man to woman? Ah. And see what grief it has brought us. Oh, just because in our partnership as parents, I was the woman, does not mean that I was the one that had to stay home. It does not mean that. I refuse to let it mean that. Oh, I see. So this was a point of principle for you, uh, a point of pride, a political motivation. It was not political. It was not a point of pride. It was surviving. A woman could not say, I'm sorry, I have to stay home with my child. She could not say that. Not without being terminated. A woman could not do that. You were half as good as you said you were. They couldn't afford to fire you. Oh, you mistake my bravado for social reality. The wound was equal, Minnie. We both bled. We were both helpless. Not in the eyes of the world, Francis. Not in the eyes of the world. Couldn't you accept... Oh, the way things were, the way they are? Yes. No. No. If we pause, if we take a breath, if we relax, you will have us as chattel again. You're being unfair. Oh, well, I'm being unfair. Oh. 
See what it has cost us. Mothers lose their child. They lose their children. They carry on. It wasn't the loss. Oh, no, it wasn't. We argued for, for several hours. Diddy was, was upstairs coughing in his bedroom. The other children, where were they? Watching, I suppose. And you dug in your heels. It didn't matter what you had to go to. A business meeting, a gathering of the local branch of the Libertarian Socialist, a, a tryst with a lover. Oh. You would not give in to me. You would not give in to me. You would not give in to me. Oh, no, no. But we made a sensible compromise. We, we found a nurse, a professional nurse, to stay the weekend to watch over the children, especially Dinny. We had a cold. It was only a cold. It was only a cold. We agreed on that. It was only a cold. I left by steamship from the Inner Harbor. You went somewhere for the weekend. And we left the children in the charge of that hapless nurse. Yes, I know the story. I know the story. You don't have to say it. I will say it. Did he die? He died of diphtheria and neither one of us was there. I know this. I know this. You don't have to remind me. I know this. It was your pride. It was your pride that kept you away. That kept you from being by his side, holding him in your arms as his breath came harder and harder as he died. He died alone because you were making a point, a political point. It was spite. It wasn't political. It was not spite. What then? It was survivor. It was survivor in a world that sought to enslave, in a world that waited for a moment of weakness to enslave. It was survivor. I watched my own mother. I watched it happen to my own mother, an uneducated Irish, as you pointed out. The wife and the scullery maid. Denise's breath came harder and harder until it stopped. Oh God, stop it, stop it. Get out. Just get out. I do not need these images in my head. I, I don't need them. Get, get out. They have always been there. You know that. They poisoned you. They destroyed us, they crippled our children. You don't understand. You will never understand. 